Warm welcome, please, for Kerry Fremling. Welcome back. Thank you, Steve. <coughs> okay, uh, let's see. Uh, uh, all right. <coughs> so it was uh, really interesting to uh, to listen to Marcus and uh, Sore. I hope I said the names uh, correctly. Uh, and uh, <coughs> because they were really saying uh, quite a lot of the similar things as I'm going to present here. Well, let's say that the beginning uh, uh, is uh, quite uh, identical to what they were saying. So the first question is, uh, what is a smart city? <coughs> so what are the goals uh, and the rationale behind uh, what we are doing and uh, trying to achieve here? Then we'll have a look at uh, a real smart service uh, so, uh, that we have implemented in our Bioto project on smart parking and charging. And then we'll go and have a look uh, behind the scenes uh, how that was actually implemented, how it works uh, using open standards uh, all the way. And then finally, uh, conclusions. Okay, <coughs> so what is a smart city? Uh, well, <coughs> before we uh, go for uh, the question or the answer, what is smart city? Uh, I think we should ask ourselves the, the question, why do we need smart cities? Uh, why, why would cities uh, want to become uh, smart uh, at all? Uh, so it was interesting, I think it was this weekend uh, when I read an article about, uh, about uh, how people think that uh, society will evolve in the future. Uh, so uh, there's something like, I think it was 220 megacities, uh, however you define that, uh, for the moment in the world. Uh, and it's expected, I think it's uh, by 2050, uh, that uh, this number of cities will uh, go down to something like uh, 60. Now. <coughs> What uh, uh, sociologists uh, think will be happening in the future is that uh, these cities uh, will need to compete uh, more and more uh, between each other to attract uh, the sort of most uh, skilled people, the best enterprises and uh, so on uh, that could then feed each other back and forth. Uh. So uh, how do you attract uh, the best uh, workforce? Uh, well, for a city uh, you have uh, several aspects. Uh, you have uh, well the reputation. Uh, is it nice to live there? Do you have nice people? Uh, uh, do you have good public service? Uh, what's the cost of living? And since I'm from Finland, uh, it's quite important about uh, safety, uh, which uh, that's one of our main assets, uh, I think. Uh, and education. Uh, <coughs> so once you have all this uh, kind, thi these kinds of okay, I'm from Finland, so climate uh, is uh, could be a <laughs> challenge in, in some cases, even in Dublin uh, maybe. Okay, but once you have all this uh, in place, uh, so uh, you create a good feeling for the city, then you will get uh, better uh, companies there too, and that attracts uh, more and more people. So then uh, cities uh, will, uh, or the smartest cities that can provide this in the best way in the future will be probably be the winners uh, in this competition. So, <coughs> Uh, in three years ago, uh, we started this EU product called a uh, Biotope, uh, where we uh, uh, have also three or actually four or five cities as uh, partners. Uh, and uh, together with them, we were thinking about what would be the most uh, relevant uh, use cases uh, to implement in these uh, different cities. Uh, and we came up uh, with this uh, illustration of those uh, use cases. And I think it's uh, quite... Uh, uh obvious when you look at these uh, use cases that uh, <coughs> you will have to have uh, systems that can interoperate between different companies, different domains uh, and different uh, systems in general. Now, uh, uh, relating to the previous presentation, uh, all these use cases uh, were actually described using uh, Archimate uh, in, in the Bioto product. So uh, I think Marcus and uh, Soda, if you, I don't know where you are, <coughs> it could be a, a good idea also if we share these. Uh, descriptions with you. <coughs> okay, it's uh, uh, good to be able to implement all kinds of uh, smart services, uh, uh, but uh, then uh, the next question is uh, how uh, much are those services uh, allowed uh, to cost? Uh, because uh, in the end, uh, we are all paying for these services as uh, taxpayers or uh, users of, of these services. Uh, so it's uh, quite relevant or really relevant that these uh, smart city services are affordable. Now, <coughs> what, uh, uh, what are the main hurdles for this uh, being uh, sort of affordable? Well, uh, uh, if you want to, or now when you start implementing smart city services, uh, then uh, typically you might get something like uh, a smart lighting uh, uh, service or a platform running on one specific uh, platform. But that platform and service will not be discussing with your uh, uh, smart mobility uh, uh, systems. 
and even if you are implementing some kind of mobility as a service uh, services you will still have uh, quite many different uh, systems and organizations that uh, will not uh, that might not uh, interoperate uh, and if you want to make these uh, systems discuss uh, with each other uh, that could be uh, uh, that uh, will take uh, for the moment usually quite a long uh, integration time uh, so interoperability between proprietary platforms is for the moment complex and it's very expensive uh, to implement also and then finally once uh, if you buy uh, your system from one specific system provider without uh, or that is only using proprietary uh, interfaces platforms and so on uh, then you have a quite a big risk of, uh, of vendor lock-in so <coughs> then uh, some economics uh, uh, bargaining power of cities, uh, that's uh, what uh, we think that uh, the cities uh, should be getting back as uh, some bargaining power uh, so that uh, they could uh, could ensure that these services are implemented in ways uh, which uh, don't become too expensive over time. Uh, now this uh, picture here comes uh, from an article uh, by Michael Porter and uh, I don't remember something Heppelman uh, on the five uh, uh, main competitive forces in any kind of business uh, and uh, these same forces uh, do also apply to cities uh, and uh, since the cities are typically end users it's really a question of the bargaining power of buyers so if uh, you want to ensure that the cities uh, have some bargaining power on uh, the services that they are buying uh, from companies for instance uh, then they should be able to uh, require that those uh, services are provided through some kind of standardized uh, APIs uh, which means that uh, they if you do manage to do this uh, then you can also change the service operator if and when needed uh, because uh, then you can impose that okay uh, if you want uh, to do business with us uh, then you have to implement your service using these specific standards so that means that uh, you have a way of avoiding vendor lock-in. Uh, it's also quite important that it becomes uh, much easier to create uh, new and more complex services. So if you have a simple service that's uh, published uh, using uh, an open standard, one or two or five uh, different services, uh, uh, you might actually get some uh, other companies or geeks even uh, just uh, uh, combining these different services uh, uh, into more complex ones and creating new services. Uh, which is uh, quite difficult to do in the current uh, landscape. So <coughs> through all this, uh, well, cities would uh, gain increased uh, bargaining power for the smart services that they implement there. Okay, <coughs> so that's the background. And those were actually the incentives for us to specify this EU product called Biotop uh, initially. And uh, uh, so the Biotop project, uh, it's... Uh, started in January 2016 and it will end uh, in the end of May this year so we are close to the finish and that's uh, why we can actually show uh, quite a lot of uh, implemented uh, systems uh, <coughs> so the objectives of uh, Biotope uh, that we set out in the beginning uh, we had four main objectives uh, and uh, uh, it was uh, quite nice to see that, uh, uh, that Marcus and uh, Soda was saying the same things that uh, uh, you should not uh, go technology first, uh, you should uh, really go uh, and see what are the end user needs. So we started off the product by really asking these uh, product partner cities uh, what are the most relevant uh, services that you, would, uh, that you think would be useful uh, for your city. And then based on those requirements, uh, use uh, open, and open standards uh, to implement them. And then deploy, test and validate uh, this uh, whole uh, these uh, systems in real use cases so that we can uh, show and have proof of concept that it's uh, possible to do it and not only that uh, it's also about uh, creating a, a sort of sustainable business ecosystems uh, so have proof of concept uh, installations that are up and running but also have enough business incentive for all the partners uh, that implement those uh, use cases uh, so that they would keep uh, keep them running uh, uh, on a sort of business based uh, business basis okay <coughs> uh, the consortium uh, well uh, the cities uh, the main partner cities that we have uh, in the product are Helsinki Brussels and Lyon 
but we did also get uh, St. Petersburg uh, on board uh, later on, uh, that doesn't show here on the map, uh, and uh, Melbourne in Australia. Uh, uh, so I think one of the important uh, partners to mention here, it's uh, definitely BMW, uh, who uh, that you will be seeing in, in the implemented use cases uh, pretty soon. So, <coughs> since I'm fundamentally a, a geek, uh, I would say uh <coughs> I sort of uh, I can speak about vi uh, business uh, stuff and so on, but it's uh, when we get to the real implementations that it, it gets fun. So uh, uh, this slide is quite old. I think many of you have uh, seen it already uh, many times, but it hasn't lost uh, any of its uh, relevance uh, uh, over the years. Uh, so what we want to achieve is that when we have a BMW or any car that arrives to any town uh, uh, here on Earth, uh, it happens to be a BMW here that arrives to Helsinki. So what would happen when this uh, BMW arrives to Helsinki? Well, uh, we would like it to be able to discover all the services provided by the uh, IT infrastructure uh, or ecosystem that we have in Helsinki. Uh, so, uh, if I need to find a parking place uh, with potentially a, place a possibility also to charge my electrical vehicle, then I would like to uh, find one place uh, that where I can actually uh, uh, find the available parking places in real time and, uh, and then uh, even well, pos potentially reserve them uh, if needed. Okay, <coughs> that's the use case uh, that, we, uh, that I'll be showing in a moment. But uh, you could also do uh, other fun stuff. Uh, so uh, once the car is uh, inside of, uh, of your city, uh, uh, if it agrees, uh, then it could also start sharing uh, information with you, such as uh, uh, if it notices that it's uh, slippery in, uh, in some place, uh, in some street, uh, then it could uh, just send an event to the city infrastructure saying that in this street is slippery just now. And once uh, the city infrastructure has received uh, 10 of, of these different uh, not notifications, 10 or more or whatever, then it could uh, start uh, sending or notifying other vehicles about this uh, in advance uh, so that uh, either the car itself or the driver would know in advance that there's a slippery spot 100 uh, meters ahead. <coughs> so this is really the kind of, of visions uh, that we set out in, uh, in uh, Biotope. Uh, okay, uh, now I was saying that we focused uh, on this smart parking and smart charging first. Uh, if you have a look at uh, the real uh, services uh, in these domains that you find in different uh, cities uh, for the moment, uh, you will see that uh, it's a completely different uh, companies and organizations uh, who typically manage uh, the parking places. You might have uh, Easy Park, uh, I don't remember the names of all these uh, companies. And then on the other hand, uh, you have the electrical vehicle charging uh, companies. Uh, so these uh, you already have two kind of domain specific uh, silos that you would need to discuss with if you want to create this kind of services. And then in addition to this, uh, all these uh, companies uh, tend to have their own uh, company specific uh, information system silos. So they have a, you could have an uh, electrical vehicle uh, charging operator that has its own charging poles that only negotiate with their own cloud service that only discusses uh, with uh, their own uh, app. So as an end user or, or a BMW owner, if I would like to, to go out to charge my BMW in Helsinki, well, I would have to find out what are all the electrical vehicle charging operators uh, there if I would like to be able to find all the places and also especially be ab able to pay. Uh, Somebody might be thinking that there's already services called Open Charge Map and uh, this kind of things. Yes, uh, you do have uh, different services that collect uh, this kind of information, but uh, they are not uh, publishing it uh, using any any specific standards. Okay, so <coughs> uh, those were the challenges. Uh, but uh, what did we do in Biotope? Uh, well, we applied, uh, so to say, our uh, or all the open standards that we could find that uh, are usable directly. And uh, uh, then uh, this will allow me to have a short break because we have a video of uh, three minutes and something. Uh, and before I put that on, I hope uh, there's the, the sound is uh, switched on. Okay, let's go ahead.
uh, <coughs> so uh, those uh, who were at the, the Open Group uh, conference in Singapore, uh, some of you might have seen this uh, video already. Uh, we did this in September last year, so there has been quite a lot of progress uh, uh, since then. And then the focus was actually on the security and safety of Internet of Things systems, uh, so uh, the focus was slightly different. Uh, this time the focus is on what really happens in the Helsinki use case uh, because all these systems were implemented and uh, installed uh, on real devices, uh, uh, real information systems uh, and so on. So uh, what you see uh, happening on the BMW uh, dashboard, uh, it's uh, actually uh, programmed by BMW and discussing with the real information systems uh, behind the scenes. So. Uh, and the Helsinki uh, use case uh, actually became a combination of uh, several smaller use cases. So uh, we first had this uh, preconditioning idea, meaning that uh, for electrical vehicle, especially in Finland, I guess in Houston or uh, in warm places, it's the same thing too. If it's uh, cold or uh, uh, really really cold or real warm outside, then you would like to cool or heat uh, the the car in advance uh, uh, with uh, as long as you have uh, access to the grid. You don't want to use the car battery. So that's why we conne connected this uh, signal from the air handling unit or ventilation system uh, to react uh, based on the context of the outdoor temperature to uh, actually start cooling down the vehicle in advance before Robert uh, gets there. Robert is not here uh, uh, yet, but he'll arrive actually this evening. Uh, okay, then we combine this with real-time traffic information and especially this uh, smart charging and uh, smart parking. Uh, so <coughs> the point uh, here is really to emphasize that, uh, well, you remember this uh, silo uh, picture. Uh, in this implementation, uh, we are using uh, okay, uh, what we call OMI nodes. Uh, so they are uh, nodes information systems that implement the open messaging interface and the other standards uh, here. So uh <coughs> the point here is that uh, uh you only have these bidirectional connections uh, shown by the arrows here that happen when you actually need them. Uh, so the air handling unit uh, uh, takes contact with the BMW backend system only once it has uh, something to tell it, uh, meaning that uh, in this case uh, what it has to say is that uh, Robert is leaving from home, so you might uh, need to know this and do something uh, smart based on that. Okay, that's the first connection, but there's only one uh, message going when uh, between the d two different nodes, uh, when and as needed. Uh, there's no sort of continuous uh, integration or, uh, or or software. Uh, well, integration work uh, that would have been done. Okay, <coughs> so then the BMW uh, starts, uh, or Robert starts driving. The BMW doesn't drive by itself yet. Uh, but uh, the car will know where Robert uh, wants to go, so then it starts uh, looking uh, the for different OMI nodes that actually provide this uh, uh, smart parking and smart charging service. And once it finds uh, some of them, then it, uh, it asks at them uh, for the available places uh, where you want to go and uh, for that specific time and so on. So uh, there's no system integration, it's just a, a, a query, well, discovery and query mechanism that happens in this specific context for a specific uh, purpose. Then <coughs> we do also have an uh, in integration or let's say ex information exchange, interoperability between the uh, electrical vehicle charging operators and the parking operators so that you can combine these uh, different pieces of information together. And finally, this uh, Gruppo Sigla that you see uh, here uh, on the bottom. So that's a, a partner that we that joined the Bito project uh, a year ago through an open call. Uh, so they have actually implemented this uh, uh, commercial level app uh, that we are using nowadays uh, that uh, discovers all uh, all all uh, published uh, parking places when and where you need to have them. Okay. So the point here is. Uh, no system integration, uh, open standards uh, all the way, and uh, uh, you find and uh, communicate with information sources when and as you need them. So <coughs> then uh, I always, uh, people always uh, keep telling me that don't show that XML in your presentations. Uh, <coughs> now I'm still show showing some XML uh, in this case. Uh, so why do I do this? Uh, well, all these different OMI nodes uh, uh, publish or have uh, what we call a data model of the data that uh, you actually can publish. Uh, so uh, what we see here, it's a 
small short snippet of a description of uh, uh, parking places and their availability. Now, <coughs> in practice, so uh, all this information here, uh, or most of it, uh, is accessible uh, using this kind of data model. But uh, the point here is that uh, you don't actually have to have these data models uh, published. Uh, so when people say that uh, that uh, uh, in smart cities uh, you have to publish all data as open data, no, you don't have to, because what you actually want to have it's uh, some kind of smart services. Uh, so no matter if uh, if all this uh, parking place uh, data was published uh, uh, or not openly, uh, the only thing that the BMW and the BMW driver wants to know about uh, is uh, uh, some kind of service uh, to which uh, you can say where am I going and when, where and when, and then I would get as a return result uh, a list of uh, the places uh, that I could try or should try and, and so on. So based on the context, uh, find the, the service that I need and then just be able to use this service, uh, no matter if uh, the data is open or proprietary as long as uh, the API is uh, open and standardized. <coughs> so, IoT standards by the Open Group. Uh, so, <coughs> the standards that you uh, were, uh, that we are using here are the ones specified by the Open Group. Uh, so, uh, it's the open messaging interface and open data format. Uh, the first version was published uh, already in 2014 of them. And I think uh, we might be the first Internet of Things work group uh, in the world. I'm not sure. Uh, we established ourselves in 2010. And uh, we are still active. So uh, uh, some of the functionality, or quite a lot of this functionality that we used in this uh, video actually comes from uh, the version 2 of these uh, standards. Uh, so uh, that's uh, uh, upcoming in 2019, uh, meaning that we actually are going to get them published quite soon. And then <coughs> we also uh, speak about this open data element framework as an Internet of Things standard quite often. It's published by the open group. Uh, it's not the Internet of Things work group, uh, but uh, uh, we think it is very relevant uh, still in this Internet of Things uh, landscape. And I'll explain soon in what way. So <coughs> uh, a little bit more about the vision uh, and background of this uh, whole Internet of Things uh, work group. So uh, I wrote my first uh, Internet of Things implementation in 2001, and uh, we actually published that in 2002. So uh, I keep on saying this, that, uh, well, what comes to Internet of Things, uh, there are not many people in this world who have done it uh, longer than, than we have. Uh, but uh <coughs> Uh, over the years and uh, after working with loads of different uh, companies and, uh, and different kinds of machines in different domains, uh, we started speaking more, about more and more about these uh, systems or systems, uh, which I think the U.S. Uh, Army initially uh, coined as, as, a, as a concept. Uh, but the point here is uh, that uh, uh <coughs> contrary to your quite many current Internet of Things systems, we think that uh, uh, in a real systems or systems world, uh, you should be able to have... Uh, even low-level uh, automation devices discussing directly using the sta same standards as they are using for discussing with backend systems, and backend systems are discussing with each other using uh, the same standards. It shouldn't really make any difference if, if it's a low-level uh, low-level information system or not, uh, <coughs> or a cloud-based service. Uh, and it should also be possible to uh, discuss uh, uh, both ways, uh, so it's not just about pushing uh, loads of sensor values to the cloud, uh, it should really be possible to, uh, to do control even locally within this room, for instance. Uh, you, do, you might not want even to have all that data going out to the cloud because of security reasons and other reasons. So, <coughs> then uh, a little bit more about technology and these standards. So the open messaging interface, uh, it has uh, all the operations that we think are needed in this kind of a system. So systems, system. So a, a read operation, of course, for getting the current values. A write operation for uh, notifying uh, and updating sensor values. So notifying about uh, events of all kinds, such as a slippery road. But uh, uh, so those are kind of classical stuff that you find in uh, just about all REST APIs, I would say. But uh, in this Internet of Things and systems of systems world, what is uh, uh, real relevant is uh, that you have some, some kind of way of subscribing to the specifically 
specific information that you are interested in in, uh, at, uh, in a given context. Uh, so I could, for instance, uh, subscribe to, uh, I don't know, Steve's uh, fridge uh, somewhere, wherever that is, and ask that to tell me if ever Steve has left the door open uh, or whatever, if uh, Steve allows me to do so. And then uh, I could even specify for how long I want to know this, so for the next half hour or, or for the next uh, whole lifetime or whatever. And whenever Steve would leave the fridge, or fridge door open for too long, then I would get a notification about that. Uh, of course, uh, you need a, a way also of cancelling such subscriptions. And uh, I was speaking about this find parking method. So we have a call uh, function and, of course, delete functionality. Then the open data format, uh, it's uh, a pretty small uh, standard. It just specifies a vocabulary of objects and info items uh, and metadata related to them, and of course values. Uh, so uh, objects uh, correspond to uh, some kind of things. Uh, a thing could be a car, a fridge, or uh, whatever else. It could even be an ERP system in, in some cases. An info item, again, uh, it could be a sensor value, but it could also be some kind of event uh, that you can subscribe to. And <coughs> we use uh, OMI and ODF together to get uh, to accomplish uh, this uh, this thing of, uh, of the needed functionality of publishing information, discovering it, uh, querying it for it, and then retrieving uh, that information. Now, the third uh, thing here on this slide, the type attribute uh, metadata elements, uh, we use uh, these uh, uh, for, so both objects and info items have some something called type in, uh, uh, in ODF. And uh, what uh, the way in which we use this in the Helsinki use case, for instance, <coughs> is that uh, since we ourselves don't want to start specifying uh, uh, well too many data types and semantics and uh, this kind of stuff, uh, we would like to prefer or we would prefer using existing standards whenever possible. Uh, so uh, uh, what we are using in practice in the Helsinki use case, it's uh, something called uh, schema.org and uh, something called Mobivoc, uh, which is uh, an extension of schema.org uh, for mobility purposes. Uh, okay, so uh, I don't know how many of you know schema.org, uh, but uh, uh, it specifies uh, uh, objects such as uh, parking facility. No, wait a minute, it's Mobivoc that specifies parking facility. Schema.org specifies what a location is, what an address is, and so on. So uh, these were the sort of trendy uh, uh, things that our developers uh, preferred using. But uh, the thing is that uh, with both of these is that they are quite domain specific. OK, schema.org is not very domain specific, but it's qu still quite limited. And neither one of these uh, are standards. So <coughs> coming to this uh, third Internet of Things uh, standard, so to say, uh, so the open data element uh, framework. Uh, now, that is uh, quite interest or very interesting uh, because it's not uh, domain specific. Uh, so ODEF in itself, uh, on the uppermost level, has uh, uh, concepts which uh, are sort of cross-domain ones. And uh, what, is, uh <coughs> what is very interesting about ODEF also is the, the so-called plugins uh, concept uh, that allows you to reuse uh, many already existing standards that are being used by by most industries uh, out in the world, such as, well, UNSPSC, UNEC, SIC, and ISO 4217. Okay, <coughs> so what does ODEF look like? Uh, I suppose mo many of you have seen it already, but uh, I think it's still good to have it in this context of Internet of Things. <coughs> so you have a um, basic concept such as person, family, name. That's the first uh, ro uh, sorry, column here. Then you have a name for that concept uh, in English, uh, so person, name, dot family. But what is uh, maybe the most interesting part here is the last thing. So you have this uh, numeric correspondence uh, to that uh, concept, so which is not language uh, specific. Uh, so it's not specific to English or, <coughs> or any other spoken languages. So uh, you remember we had this uh, air handling unit in the Helsinki use case that uh, was discussing uh, with the car. Well, uh, this is uh, an example of a small part of the data model of that air handling unit. Uh, and what this actually says, uh, if I'm using ODEF codes, is that uh, 
this, uh, is a, this object is a product according to the UNSPSC uh, specification that is an air handling unit and uh, it's uh, reporting its fresh air uh, sensor value which is actually the outdoor, current outdoor temperature uh, using the UNECE REC20 uh, 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 specified value. So, okay, now I lost my own track. <laughs> <coughs> so, uh, temperature expressed in degrees Celsius. So, that's one example of how you can combine these standards together to actually represent your data in a standardized and annotated way. And uh, yesterday somebody was speaking, I think, think it was the first presentation on the subsurface uh, surface work and so on, uh, uh, where it, uh, there was uh, a requirement on separating data and services. Well, this is one way of doing it. If you store data using these uh, standards, then, then then you will understand what it is about. Uh, and uh, I won't spend too much time on this because I only have one minute left. Uh, <coughs> so uh, the advantage of uh, ODEF, uh, oh there are several advantages. Uh, okay, it's a simple low bandwidth code, but also it's not language specific. Uh, so uh, uh, and since I think the world is getting more and more global, it's, uh, that's quite an important aspect. Of so, the common standards landscape. Uh, <coughs> in Biotope, uh, or actually with the Internet of Things work group, uh, we think uh, that uh, when you implement any kind of uh, Internet of Things system or system assistance, well, you, have you will have a stack of, uh, of different standards and protocols uh, that need to interoperate. Uh, depending on the actual use case requirements, on lowest level, you will have to uh, 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 choose them based on if they're wired, wireless, uh, or other uh, sort of use case specific requirements. Uh, on the uppermost level, uh, you might want to use uh, s uh, semantics that are that come that are uh, specified or standardized for different domains. But still, if you want to keep uh, all this interoperable, then this uh, waste uh, here should be pretty thin. Uh, thin. Just like for the web, uh, you have HTTP and HTTPS. Well, in the same way for this Internet of Things to be successful, you, wouldn't, uh, you would like to have quite few standards there in the middle. So <coughs> we have applied uh, this principle in Biotope uh, for implementing uh, many other services also in the, in the participating cities. So uh, bottle bank uh, emptying and uh, other kinds of things. Uh, uh, we have also done this smart parking system, implemented that f in all the three cities, together, wi together with the BMW. So then we come to the conclusions, uh, because I see that I should be stopping now based on the timing. <coughs> conclusions, okay. Uh, open standards for implementing smart cities do exist. Uh, then it's a different question if uh, the cities will uh, start uh, requiring, th requiring the use of these and the whole point uh, here, if you remember the beginning, is uh, to that smart cities uh, could actually increase the bargaining power and uh, to allow us as uh, citizens also to get these services simpler, but also without paying uh, too much uh, for them. Uh, we do have real-life implementations, as you saw. Uh, uh, they have uh, made quite a lot of progress since uh, that video. And uh, tomorrow morning uh, we uh, have all the three partner cities presenting their use cases and how they were implemented. That's the morning program. And in the afternoon uh, uh, you can participate in this coding workshop uh, where uh, you can see all the open source uh, components and so on. It's uh, actually very easy to take into use and publicly available. Please take a seat. Thank you. Well, we do have uh, a couple of questions. Uh, let's see. Do you see a future where all these smart things are represented in ODF or ODEF to allow more seamless interoperability? Well, <coughs> actually, I think there's a sometimes misunderstanding that uh, you don't uh, have to represent uh, all the all the data and all the services of these uh, things uh, using uh, these standards. It's uh, just like with the web uh, that uh, you you have loads of information about uh, different things in databases and so on, but. Uh, what you actually publish uh, to be available to others, uh, it's uh, just a small subset right. of, of that. So uh, uh, you would not have to model all of them using uh, these standards, uh, but uh, if you want, uh, or the data that you want to exchange and the services that you want to publish, then, then those should be represented, of course, using some open standards. Okay. 
Um, the common standards landscape at ODEF, you said different domains have different vocabularies and requirements. Can you share what is the main added value of ODEF? Oh, well, I should have taken Ron here. On yes, I know Ron, Ron <laughs> would be here, but... Uh, well, uh, I, I did have a slide on that, so uh, okay, it's a low bandwidth uh, and so on, but I think the main uh, uh, thing is really, that's my personal view, it's uh, the support of these plugins, uh, so the support for uh, existing standards which are already used uh, by customs and, uh, and manufacturing companies uh, mm -hmm. all around the world. Uh, so. Uh, uh, since we already do have these standards, uh, I think it uh, would be worth uh, at least uh, taking them into use uh, as far as possible before starting to reinvent the new vocabularies. Okay. Um, one of the things that seems to be consistent about smart city implementations around the world is a lack of standardization between those implementations and approaches. You're using open standards in the Biotope project um, how do you see the role of open standards, or how can it be expanded? Uh, yeah, that's guess, what. Really I guess what you see the value <laughs> of it, but uh, how do we get other people to see the value of it? I guess. Yeah, I think. Well, let's say that this this kind of conferences or the kind of events that we have tomorrow, uh, uh, that's for really showing uh, that it, it is feasible and simple to do it uh, using these standards. I, I think it's uh, most of these implement systems can be implemented uh, in, a, in simpler ways even if you reuse uh, what we did in, uh, in these uh, cities than if you actually start a, a completely new project. Uh. Right. So through use cases showing that it's uh, feasible and uh, not more expensive. So you mentioned, you mentioned tomorrow. You, you're going to give a plug for the event tomorrow? Or should I? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I, I also a little bit quicker with the conclusions. Uh, so, yeah, tomorrow uh, I think it's in this room or one part of these rooms. So, uh, so we have uh, the whole uh, morning uh, session uh, where we go through uh, the technical levels uh, of this, uh, what we have implemented. But especially uh, we have these uh, uh, three partner city uh, presentations. So the end users uh, saying what are the benefits that they got from uh, this and uh, how it was implemented, how it was, was perceived and so on. And uh, as I was saying in the afternoon, there's a coding workshop, so uh, mm. I might be long on this, uh, sorry, but mm, <laughs> no, uh, my, my students, when, when, they s when they see uh, how uh, I or we have are setting up Internet of Things systems in five to ten minutes, uh, they, they have been asking me for years uh, that uh, why don't you uh, tell uh, other people about this? Uh, I mean, instead of uh, getting your own Raspberry Pis and all that and doing, spending loads of time, uh, you can mm -hmm. get it up and running quickly. And then we expand that also through the Leon use case uh, to right. the, the real systems or systems. So last question, Gary. Do you think it's possible to scale what you are learning and defining about smart cities to a global stage? Oh, technically, definitely, yes. But uh, the big challenges uh, quite often tend to be commercial or uh, other political. Understood. Gary Framley, thank you very much.